It takes more to make a nation than a stretch of earth or a mass of individuals. Mother India is not a piece of earth. She is a power, a godhead, said Sri Aurobindo, patriot and poet, nationalist and sage. He celebrated his 75th birthday on August 15th, 1947. On the same day, at midnight, was born the free and modern state of India. In an address to the nation, broadcast on All India Radio, Sri Aurobindo said, I take this coincidence as the sanction and seal of the divine force that guides my steps on the work with which I began life. The third son of Dr. K. D. Ghosh and Swadna Lata, Aurobindo was born on August 15, 1872. His name, meaning Lotus, the symbol of divine consciousness, was appropriate and prophetic. only seven, he and his brothers were sent to England to be educated in a completely British tradition. Throughout his school life at St. Paul's Academy and his college years at King's College, Cambridge, Aurobindo's brilliance was recognized by those who taught him. In August 1892, Aurobindo had passed the final examination of the Indian Civil Service. He spent two years of probation as a classical scholar at Cambridge. When the time came to pass the last formality before joining the writing test, he set his mind resolutely against the service. He repeatedly failed to appear for the test. Instead, he returned to India in the service of the Gaikwad of Baroda. He not only made himself invaluable to the backward, but from 1897 also began to teach at the University of Baroda. By 1905, he was the acting principal there. The students hung on his words. He was not only an unorthodox and an inventive teacher, but also a speaker of high order. Dr. Clark, the principal, remarked upon Orbindo's unusual eyes. There is mystic fire and light in them. They penetrate into the beyond. If Joan of Arc heard heavenly voices, Orbindo probably sees heavenly visions. Sri Aurobindo himself said that his energies in the period were in Sanskrit, in literature, and in the national movement. He studied the Ramayana, the Mahabharata, the Upanishads, the Gita, Kalidasa's plays, and other Sanskrit works. He also wrote prolifically translations, poems, poetic drama, and prose writing on a wide variety of subjects. Below the surface of his placid life, however, Aurobindo was preparing for political action. In 1903, Sri Aurobindo visited Bengal and formed a committee of five to be in overall charge of revolutionary work in Bengal. Between 1903 and 1905, Sri Aurobindo had several mystic experiences. However, 1904 is the year in which he actually commenced his yoga. In 1905, Bengal was in ferment because Lord Curzon had decided to partition the state. The cry of Bande Matra was on every patriot's lips. In 1905,
1906, Sri Aurobindo became the principal of the newly established National College, which had been set up as an alternative to the institutions run by the British. He also became the leading spirit of the revolutionary paper, Bande Mataram. His writings in the paper were marked by a spiritual elevation which gave nationalism a new dimension. As a leading nationalist in 1906, the fiery young Aurobindo Ghosh had preached full-blooded revolution to free India. A year later, when Lala Lajpat Rai was deported by the British, Sri Aurobindo wrote an editorial in the daily Bande Mataram. The hour for speeches and fine writing is past. Men of the Punjab, race of the lion, let them hear a hundred times louder your war cry. Jai Hindustan. Sri Aurobindo talked of independence at a time when other Congress leaders would talk only of colonial government and he firmly fixed the goal of Swaraj in the national consciousness. In December 1906, Sri Aurobindo attended the Congress session. From this time onwards, he not only controlled the policy of the Bande Matram, but also of the Nationalist Party. The policy of both were to stir the people into a demand for complete independence, an aspiration which was almost inconceivable to the Indian mind at the time. All along, Sri Aurobindo maintained his links with the underworld revolutionary movement and kept an eye on the Uganda, the powerful order of the revolutionaries. At the Surat Congress in December 1907, the nationalists led by Tilak and Sri Aurobindo and the moderates in the Congress parted ways. The aim of the nationalists was complete freedom through armed struggle if need be. The moderates aimed at Swaraj within the British Empire and progress through negotiations. A split was inevitable. The struggle for freedom continued as before. Lord Minto, the then Viceroy of India, wrote to London that Sri Aurobindo is the most dangerous man we now have to reckon with. Back in Calcutta, Sri Aurobindo was implicated in the famous Alipur bomb case in which two English ladies were killed. Soon, the British locked him up. He spent a year in prison doing intense yoga and meditation. He had a vision, a divine vision of such intensity that it radically reoriented his consciousness. Upon his release from Alipur jail in 1909, he said, The only result of the wrath of the British government was that I found God. He left British India for voluntary exile in French Pondicherry and a life of intense spiritual sadhana. Almost 20 years later, Rabindranath Tagore visited him there. Tagore commented, I could realize that he had been seeking for the soul and had gained it. You have the word and we are waiting to accept it from you. India will speak through your voice to the world. On August 15, 1947, Sri Aurobindo spoke to India of his dreams for a new nation and the new world order which was emerging. The dreams he unfolded at the time seemed impossible to be realized, but today all his dreams are gradually getting fulfilled. What were Sri Aurobindo's five dreams? First and foremost was the dream of a free and independent India, now almost fully realized.
almost, but not completely. The free modern nation was born in 1947, but the old motherland had been divided into two. Sri Aurobindo said that this would seriously impair the country's destiny. The two halves must come together again, not necessarily in the old form, but on a new basis of cooperation. Unity must and will be achieved, for it is necessary for the greatness of the country's future. His second dream was the resurgence and liberation of the people of Asia and her return to her great role in the progress of human civilization. Since Sri Aurobindo's address to the nation, Asia has become ever more powerful in the world order. North and South Korea, Cambodia, Indonesia and Malaysia are some of the nations which have attained freedom since 1947. They have built strong countries with resurgent economies. China is awakening from its long slumber. The Japanese economy dominates the world. The power of the vast, technologically advanced people of Asia is being recognized by the world. Sri Aurobindo's third dream was that of a new spirit of unity which would prevail, leading to world union and a fairer, brighter and nobler life. This would be in the interest of both large and small nations. It would include multilateral citizenships and a voluntary fusion of cultures. In spite of tremendous difficulties, the old boundaries would break down and hostilities be forgotten. For said Sri Aurobindo, unification is a necessity of nature. A new spirit of oneness will take hold of the human race. Man has seen that well-being is interdependent. The planet is bound by a common threat. We have a common destiny. Sri Aurobindo's fourth dream was that India's greatest gift to the world would be that of spirituality. India had always been the spiritual heart of the world, though in the past, materially too, it created a rich and highly developed civilization. India had been a world leader in every field, from philosophy and logic to medicine and astronomy. This synthesis of an intense vitality combined with a high spirituality remained the master key of the Indian mind. Now, this would spread rapidly to the rest of the world. Spirituality is entering Europe and America in an ever increasing measure.
the spirituality that Sri Aurobindo speaks of is distinct from any organized religion, bound in the narrow limits of a creed, cult, or ceremonial ritual. It is a search for the divine in all of us, which allows infinite freedom, variation, and universality. Its aim is not rejection, but perfection of life. Sri Aurobindo's fifth and final dream envelops the whole world. Man has made great advances in science and technology, but has not been able to solve his basic problems. Human nature has not changed. For this, says Sri Aurobindo, to rise to a higher consciousness beyond the mind. The evolution of man is not ended. The human being has to evolve further into a different consciousness, a different life. Man would be transformed, a physical transformation, along with mental and emotional transformation. He would evolve a body of light, an integral development of mind, soul, and body. These were the fruits of his intense sadhana done at Pondicherry, which he laid before us. He gave us the vision and showed us the way. There is hope within each one of us. The road is open for us to travel towards unity with the divine. For the divine life to establish itself upon earth. In the words of the mother, the spiritual collaborator of Sri Aurobindo, preparing for a big change. Will you help?